It's an honor to be here. Um, I remember vividly, I saw many hands go up today, that this is your first uh, attendance. I came to this conference about five years ago, and I came as a urologist with a physician assistant to learn how hormone manipulation may help my patients with uh, sexual dysfunction. And although you'll see today I'm going to have some redundancy in talking about the uh, historical perspective of testosterone and prostate cancer, dub going over what, uh, some of what Paul Thompson talked about earlier, what I learned in that first conference when we talked repetitively about the metabolic syndrome, it really was important to drive home an important message. At that time, I was not much uh, uh, in touch with the metabolic syndrome and the effects that it has on we as a society or we as individuals. And after that time, I can say today I'm a far better doctor because I do respect and understand the importance of the collective uh, addressing of our metabolic needs hormonally, energy-wise, uh, exercise-wise, and dieting. But for many, it's the uh, views that are carried that have uh, an, uh, an impact on our, our fear and how we manage patients. When we take an oath as a physician, to the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. And so when we have a long-standing view that there may be something negative relative to prostate cancer and testosterone, it may put a pause in our, our choices of management. Where's, how do you move the slides? Oh, just this one. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I did train at University of Virginia. I chose University of Virginia because I was uh, interested in pursuing an academic career. And at the time, Jay Gillenwater was not only the president of the American Urology Association, but he also had authored the uh, textbook of urology, the four volume book of uh, adult and pediatric urology. He ultimately, during that, that, my tenure, was also the uh, chief editor to the journal and the, the president of the AUA. Below him was uh, Stu Howards who was the chairman of the American Board of Urology, chartered with the responsibility of defining all the uh, testing materials that were um, required to meet the certification of board certification, as well as uh, Al Jenkins, who had written the textbook of stone management. So it was a, it was a facility that data managed, uh, data mattered, and we need to know it. And we were ground, it was pushed on us every day, and we made decisions based on what the literature had said. And I think that, as we see from Dr. Rousier, the importance of looking at the literature to guide us. And sometimes that literature can be very strong, and sometimes it can be weak, but the impact may be stronger than it should have. And I'd like to show some of those illustrations. Doctor, many of us, clearly the majority of us in this room are physicians, except for my brother who was nice enough to come see me. But doctor in Latin does not mean healer. It actually means teacher. And every time, and I thought when I went to University of Virginia to be become a teacher, and I gave up a position at Hopkins to uh, go into private practice to the dismay of many of those at UVA, um, what I realized is I see patients every day as students. What I can show them and teach them is, in fact, critical. They won't learn unless they're motivated, and I can't teach them something I don't know. Those are very important points. And as I stand here and say that the slides I have may change in a year or two based on the understanding of the literature, my intention won't change. I want to do the right thing for my patients, and I can't actually offer them something that I don't understand and believe. Each patient that I see, I try to, them to look at me as someone who would treat them as though they were my brother, my mother, my father, somebody that I care dearly for and will apply my best efforts to incorporate my knowledge and understanding to what they're in need of. James Foster was one of the uh, ph most phenomenal physicians in my experience. Um, he was a world-renowned surgeon whose biggest impact to me was one time where he, we walked into a room and he just made it so important for us to focus on the person in front of us as a collective as opposed to all the individual findings on a lab test or x-ray or some uh, blood pressure, uh, that we all have innate gifts to be able to recognize another person sitting next to us or in church or in the community and recognize a lot of about them their circulation, their weight, their uh, attention, and we need to be able to tap into all those things. And I can say that um, uh, as a urologist trained is in the 90s, prostate cancer uh, was a disease that the vast majority of men who showed up had metastatic disease. There was, uh, as we've learned about talking with Dr. Thompson this morning, PSA, and over the last years, PSA's gotten a, a black eye, because many look at the fact that when it's in the abnormal range between 4 and 10, that 3 out of 4 times it's, quote, wrong. 
It's wrong because in the pursuit of the biopsy, you don't find cancer, and therefore we were pursuing something that was not there. What they're not recognizing is that one in four times that it's identifying prostate cancer and giving us a chance to identify a relative disease process. It's a continuum of a disease. Everybody with prostate cancer doesn't have the, the, uh, something akin to pancreatic cancer. It is a very different disease based on marching up that Gleason score. So as, he, as Dr. Thompson talked about earlier, we look at as we age, for most men it's almost inevitable. If you look at autopsy studies, as many as 70% of men are 70, 80% of men that are 80, if they were to die in a car accident or a stroke or heart attack and have an autopsy, they'd have prostate cancer. They obviously didn't die of it, but they obviously died of something else. And that's what I think we all have to put in perspective. What's the collective of that person, regardless or in, con in concert with their PSA, their physical exam, and the rest? But back in the 1990s, since 75% 75 of the men who had prostate cancer had metastatic disease, and there was no treatment or no, uh, no cure for metastatic disease, as there is not today, the primary therapy for them was androgen deprivation therapy. The good consequences of the androgen deprivation therapy were that we would see, now that the PSA was available, a rapid drop in their PSA. We'd see a significant drop in the volume of the disease and symptoms that may be associated with that. I remember vividly a man with a PSA of 18,000, and he had come in with a broken collarbone. And it was by identifying cancer in the bone that led to a biopsy that led to the diagnosis of prostate cancer, which then led to the PSA, that we found prostate cancer. With androgen deprivation therapy, the bone healed, the PSA dropped to single digits, but ultimately he did succumb to advanced prostate cancer. What are the bad sides of the androgen deprivation therapy? Well, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, muscle weakness, cardiac complications, orthopedic complications, and cholesterol alterations. Those look now at the opposite side of that equation. We see so much in the literature or in the news today about the use of testosterone and the positive attributes are available when we replace testosterone. Those are the opposite. And that's where the aha message for me five years ago when I came to this conference was I vividly remember watching those men who I started on androgen deprivation therapy go from a status where they were relatively strong and decent shape, had energy, mental focus, to over the months, literally walking in and with the eyes like Dr. Foster wanted me to have, would be changing. They'd be putting on more weight. They're having more problems with their blood pressure. They're on more medications for blood pressure or cholesterol. They're having more complications of osteoporotic changes or musculoskeletal issues. It was clearly bringing them down. But I celebrated every time I saw them that their PSA was down, you know? And sadly, over the years, we literally started to define that we induced the metabolic syndrome. So the aha, when we're now at a conference talking about the value of testosterone replacement, I was on the other side of that equation. I was that pocket protector, nerdy little kid, sat in the front of the medical school class who was at UVA being told, take the testicles off, to give them something now at Lupron, you give them a shot once a month to drive the testosterone down, and it was the right thing to do. 